I, I appreciated the, Mr. Karsher showing a, a photo of a program. I have an old one with me today, not with me today. Uh, it's from the early 1900s, and a group by the uh, Gus Gufterson Orchestra, and it shows that they're playing, uh, it's in Germantown somewhere outdoors, and they're playing a concert at 4.30, and then a concert at 8.00. So I looked over the program and I'm thinking, that's barely an hour program there, 5.30. Okay, what do they do between six and eight? Well, right up in the corner, German dinner, 60 cents. So I think I figured out why they did the two concerts like that with just that amount of time. Isn't that convenient? So, so anyway, um, Hagerstown Band, I'll talk a little bit about, about the band. It, it does have ties to Sousa, which I think are a, a, little, in, a little bit interesting. Um, I've been a member of the band now for over 20 years. I'm on the board of directors. And um, anyway, we'll get started and I'll tell you a little bit about this. Uh, we are lucky there are historical documents that, that are extant about the Hagerstown Band and its development. Um, it is officially titled the Municipal Band of Hagerstown. It traces its roots back 110 years. We used to say that we had never missed a season. Um, even during World War II, the band continued with women playing who were not normally allowed to. Ah, oh, the good old days. <laughs> See, that's, why, that's why I say that, you know, just, just to get that reaction. Um, uh, but, um, and, well, women and students. But then, a few years ago, came COVID. And our string of continuous seasons was over. The city closed the park where we play and we had no option. We had to cancel, we had to cancel our season. Yay. All right, in 1900, there were at least four different bands in the city of Hagerstown. We had the Hagerstown Concert Band, we had the Western Maryland Band, the South End Band, the Silver Rhine Band, and other smaller groups in the surrounding areas, uh, Birdsboro, Smithstown, Roarsville, all the little towns, they all had their own little bands. I have found no evidence of such, but I would suspect there might have been one or more railroad bands also playing. Uh, Hagerstown was known as the Hub City because it was an interchange with the Norfolk and Western, the Western Maryland, the Pennsylvania. The Reading Railroad had trackage rights, the Cumberland Valley was there, so there was a lot of railroads, and I, I would suspect there, there, there might, might have been one there. There was also a band, and I, one reason I like history a little bit, sometimes some of the characters you, you run into, there was a band called the Beaver Creek Band, and it played in an area referred to as Bagtown, which as close as anybody can tell me was the northwest part of the city. Um, according to the director of the Silver Rhine Band, a man named Roger Harp, he said, the conductor of the Beaver Creek Band, while competent, lived in isolation in a log cabin in the woods and appeared to be hiding from someone. <laughs> Most of uh, the conductors were in all probability local musicians who really didn't have a whole lot of uh, formal training. In this time period, concerts were not really, at least for these bands, concerts were not really their main thrust. They played for Sunday school picnics and church festivals and parades. And we have this uh, quote from the Daily Mail newspaper. The monster parade and rally takes place in Hagerstown. Banners fly, flags wave, and bands play as children march to the fairgrounds. Notice bands, plural. Why is that interesting? Well, some years ago, a man named Jay Wiles wrote a long history of the band and uh, talked to many survivors, you might say, elderly people who had been members of the band. And one of them said the reason they brought more than one band in was hopefully one of them would have had enough members to play. So they have to go with that. So in 1915, oh, hang on a second. Sousa was also known in the area. This is a copy of his 1896 tour schedule, and I think I have it in your handout. And if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see uh, Ch uh, Hagerstown on, I believe, a matinee performance, and then Chambersburg, an evening performance. And below that, Carlisle. And Carlisle, yeah. yeah. It's the only time the band ever came to Carlisle. Well, th this is this is looks like an old Air Force band schedule because it's brutal. I mean, it's every night. It doesn't change. And uh, 
Of course, Hagerstown to Chambersburg today is a half hour drive. Back then, you had to get on the train. Both also are listed as playing at the Opera House. Both of these buildings, as far as I know, do not exist anymore. They have been since torn down. So anyway, in 1915, the city fathers decided Hagerstown needed one band, and that they could probably get away with taking the better musicians from all the other bands and forming one group. Um, so they formed a committee. A man named, sorry, the Chamber of Commerce, they included a man named S. E. Miniam, who was a piano store owner, B. Armstrong, insurance salesman, M. I. Patterson, hotel manager, and J. C. Byron, retired army major. We know very little about any of them. I assume the man who would run a piano store would probably know a little bit about music but it's not recorded anywhere whether or not these gentlemen had any training in music whatsoever. But, as Sousa said, it's easy to establish a band if the leading minds of the community are brought to realize the civic desirability of a band. And I think they, they, they did. Of course, try to get funds for that, that's a whole other story. But they, what, what they did manage. So they placed an ad in the uh, New York music journal advertising for a music director. <clears throat> and in 1915, on June 9th, Vermont Haas was hired as the director. On July 9th in 1915, they did their first concert. One month later, why do I call it the beginning of the end? It was born on July 9th, 1915. <laughs> Last fall. Mm -hmm. And we know Horton, and of course, uh, the electric, better the electric guitar. And, uh, 20 years later would be the birth of Elvis Presley. Can I ask a question about yeah. the picture? Yes. The caption, left the band with director Wheelock. Wheelock, Is yeah. that Denison or his brother? You know? I don't know. Uh, both of the Carlisle Indian School. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. That picture really? is actually a few yes. years afterwards. The band is by then is organized. It's not under its original director yet. Mm. Um, so anyway, Vermin Moss apparently was a, a very good conductor. Uh, he had trained in Ohio at a school called the Dana School of Music and uh, was, according to all accounts, a very demanding taskmaster and kind of whipped the band into shape, shall we say. Uh, he led the band for two seasons. Uh, then he left for a year, then returned for a short period in 1918 uh, before resigning to start a piano and organ school in Allentown, which apparently some years later went bankrupt. So from then on until 1920, the band had a couple different conductors. No one actually was outstanding, so to speak. They kept the group together. And then in 1920, we enter what we call the Peter Buys era. Now, Peter Buys, born in Amsterdam, he was Dutch. In Dutch, his name is pronounced Bees. However, Everybody and his uncle in the Hagerstown area says Peter Buys, so that's what we still say. We refer to this as Peter Buys. Was a uh, musician, obviously in Holland. At the age of 16, he joined the ship's band uh, as a clarinet player on the Holland America line. I didn't know they went back that far, but apparently they did. And in 1903, became an American citizen and somehow became engaged to play with the band at West Point. Now, two musicians there had played with Sousa, we're still in touch with Sousa, and told him about buys. Sousa came to hear him play and hired him on the spot in 1912 as an E-flat clarinet player. Sousa also found out that Baez was an exceptional composer and arranger, and he used those talents. Baez did an enormous amount of work for Sousa in terms of transcriptions and things of that nature. It is reported but not verified that he did over 2,000 transcriptions for the Sousa Band. That sounds awfully high to me. Maybe it's true, so I don't have any particular evidence one way or the other. So anyway, he left the band, he left the Sousa Band in, uh, to become the director of the, of the, um, the Hunt Huntington Band. Uh, Sousa had learned of the opening and actually referred him to it. He said he didn't want to lose buys as a performer, but he also wanted to see him, him get ahead, because he was an ambitious man. After that, <coughs> Sousa never again, oh, that's Mr. Buys, there we go, there's Mr. Buys, 
in a, an older photo. After he left, it is said that Susan never again used E-flat clarinet in his band, <laughs> saying the instrument cannot be played in tune except by a master. I would argue that too. And there are no more Peter Buys. So anyway, um, it's also interesting that in, in the Daily Mail newspaper reported at one time about Susan and Buys' music composition working arrangement, so to speak. And they said that Susan frequently sketched out a new, is this on the film? <clears throat> oh, sorry. Sousa frequently sketched out a new march in incomplete form, then turned it over to his youthful assistant to finish and polish up ready for performance. So maybe some of the marches that we credit Sousa with may not actually be entirely Sousa's. He may have, uh, I don't know, there's no particular statement as to how much of a skeleton he would hand to buys to do. We don't, we don't know that. But through his, um, Bies would join the band, and he would have the second longest tenure as music director. Our current music director has the longest tenure. Uh, his name is Lynn LaRue. He is retiring this year uh, after 50 years as director of the band. So, yeah. Bies was a busy man. He also taught music, served as president of the American Band Masters Association. Um, I think Mr. Mitchell showed a concert schedule, an ABA concert, and at the top, was a composition by Peter Watts. After Sousa retired, even before he retired, when he was still in DC, he came to visit Buys on numerous occasions. There are at least documented at least 15 times, possibly more. And he would always have him guest conduct the Hagerstown Band. The way they worked it is Sousa would conduct the first half, then he would call Buys to the stand, he'd turn over the baton, and Buys would conduct the second half of the concert. And it just says what I just said. <coughs> yeah, here's the, uh, the quote from the, the paper about, yeah, he might have done a little bit more than, the, than Susan let on, but anyway. Um, given the amount of music that Bias composed or arranged for Susan, you know, it's really no surprise that there's a definite compositional uh, similarity between them. You have in your handout a copy of uh, Huntington March in which, uh, Look at my own here. The Huntington Mean Invisible Band. Um, it's standard band form of this time. We have an introduction, we have two melodies that, that are both repeated, then we have the obligatory modulation up a perfect fourth, and goes into a trio section. Uh, perhaps, again, what we call the dogfight, and then the repeat of the trio. In Bize's work, uh, he frequently has what I would call a double trio with two different melodies in the trio and interludes between the two. Nonetheless, very, very similar to what most com composers were doing that, that day. I also think it's interesting that in the uh, upper right-hand corner where he puts his name, he simply puts P. Buys Sousa's band. <laughs> Apparently he needed to say nothing more than that. The other one you have is a march called Gateway to, to the South. Um, again, same thing. You really can't find a whole lot of difference between the two, and that's how he uh, that's ha how he wrote. The very last page is the chicken scratch, uh, the original copy of Gateway to the South. Hagerstown Band has a number of Bize's works that are still in manuscript that have never been published. Uh, we hope one of these days to 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 get get them out there. So anyway, now where did Gateway to the South come from? Well. For many years, Hagerstown was known as the hub city because it was the hub for so many railroads. The city fathers wanted to change that. They wanted to change the name of, this, of Hagerstown to Gateway to the South. Bize even wrote a march, Gateway to the South. Didn't work, it's still a hub city. <laughs> so there so there it is, that's, that's just it. And you know, Bize's connection to Sousa might also be shown a little bit, uh, his instrumentation of the group he followed Sousa almost exactly when he could. He couldn't do it all the time, but his, uh, the, the instrumentation is, uh, is pretty much exactly the same. The Hagerstown Band today. We're a band that we do 11 concerts, 11 summer, con 11 summer concerts. Um, occasionally one off season. This year we're doing one at Christmas. Um, 
We do all 11 at the city park, uh, where we have been since, since the beginning of time, you might say. Uh, we are supported uh, primarily financially by the city of Town. As I mentioned earlier, only one law, Susan, and our director is retiring this year. The park where, where we play has its own interest, you might say, and, and it dates back to 1843 when a man named William Heiser built a, a home on a tract of land given to him by his father, which is what we call the mansion house. It is there today, and that is where we have our archives room and our library. The archives room was started eight years ago, maybe. We uh, have a, a woman who is the official historian. We have box after box after box of material, programs, music, you name it. Much of it, most of it, uncatalogued unorganized, and she has taken on the Herculean task of putting this together. We do have um, a number of items on display, original uniforms, photographs, th things of that, that nature. Um, we are not, we are only open maybe once or twice a summer. Uh, we hope to increase that in the future so we have, we can have more regular hours where people can come and look at what, what we have. Anyway, and um, so that is the mansion house. There was a, it still is, a very strong spring there that provided water for an area became known as Heiser's Wood. And in 1854, Hagerstown Fair Association held their exhibitions there. During the Civil War, it was a favorite camping place for whatever army, army happened to be in possession of Hagerstown because it went back and forth several times. In 1915, the same year that they formed the band, they decided to buy the park they bought 50 acres for $40,000, and the improvements included pavilions, bathhouses, and a bandstand. In 36, the band made the park its home, so to speak. The band pavilion, where Sousa had just conducted, was deemed as too small. It was then moved to another park in town, and a new building was built using money for the Works Project Administration. Uh, the band shell, many people will consider it one of the best anywhere. I know I do, one of the best I've ever played in. Um, it is acoustically outstanding. The actual shell inside is referred to as a floating shell because it's not actually fastened anywhere. It just kind of sits there and it's curved up and it, it's a nice place to play and when you, the few times I've been in the audience to actually listen, it, it has a wonderful sound. So it is it's one, of our, uh, one of our things. So while it's not the original structure where Sousa conducted, it's close. It's right there where the original one was, so we tell people you are on, on hallowed ground when you're there. <laughs> anyway, um, as I said, we play 11 concerts a summer. Uh, we only have two rehearsals per concert. That's it. Monday and Thursday night for an hour and a half. Then we do the concert on Sunday night. Uh, sometimes only one rehearsal. This year, our Independence Day concert, we'll only have one rehearsal because Thursday is Independence Day. We won't have that then. Um, we are healthy fi financially. Um, the membership today, we have at least a half a dozen retired military bandsmen, uh, me included. A lot of uh, local music teachers, band directors, high school band directors, college band directors, and uh, a lot of top-notch local musicians. Uh, after Peter Buys and before our present director, there were four different directors, Kenneth Slater, Joe Leaptick, and uh, M Michael Malio. Under Slater, that's when the band actually added women. It didn't take them too long. Only had to get to about the 1970s to do that, but they, we finally came into the, the 20th century. So anyway, so that, that's a, a little bit about about us. Uh, we have a, a couple of quirky little things. Uh, our director, LaRue, does not hire the musicians for the band. He leaves that to the section leaders. And it has worked, worked out so far. He does not question who we hire. He has, um, I've been section leader now for over 10 years. He has never questioned anybody that I've brought in to play. And um, it makes less work for him, but also gives the section leaders more of a, a way to shape their own, their own section. Question, are the members paid? No, we are not paid, um, except for a little stipend, which we call, we, we euphemistically call it uniform maintenance, but we don't have uniforms, we just wear polo shirts. Um, it's rough, it's gas money, you know, put it that way. It's about 25 bucks a concert is all you get. Unless 
you're a soloist and you get double for that night. Ooh, you get that. <laughs> so anyway, um, and finally, two, two little bits of, of, of trivia, you might say. Oh, it's, it's, right, we have over 100 musicians on, on the rolls in the American tradition. Two little, little quirky things that pe people might find funny. Um, we end every concert with a hymn. That's a little unusual. Sometimes it's just a simple arrangement. Sometimes it's more involved. Where did that come from? Well, back in the 60s, some of the local pastors decided that they didn't necessarily like the band playing on Sunday nights because they felt it was pulling people away from their Vesper service. So after some negotiation, the band decided, well, how about if we end each concert with a hymn, something spiritually uplifting to the audience? Well, they said, okay. So to this day, even though no one's complained about it, we still traditionally we end with a hymn. So you always you'll always hear us end with a hymn. On that. The other one, which is even which is kind of weird, every Independence Day we play the William Tell Overture. Mm -hmm. William Tell Overture doesn't have a darn thing to do with Independence Day. But somewhere along the line, and here it gets hazy as to where this actually started, um, we started playing it, and about eight years ago, Lynn decided that well. Let's see if we can get away with not playing the William Tell Overture on the 4th of July. Our audience lost their minds. <laughs> he was inundated with emails and phone calls and strongly written letters about why was he interfering with this tradition. So every 4th of July, out comes the William Tell Overture. So that's a little bit about the Hagerstown Band and what, what we're doing down there. We don't have the tradition, the long tradition you have, but we got a pretty good one. And, and we're, we're proud of it. Yes? Yeah. That is sort of similar to the practice of all these bands who are just playing 1812 on July 4th. Yeah, yeah, which has nothing to do with July 4th, yeah. except cannon it's shot. Loud. Yeah. And by the way, if you ever want to make a really good cannon shot, we did this in high school. We took a 12 gauge shotgun with blanks <laughs> and fired it into an empty 55 gallon oil drum. Mm -hmm. That's a sound will wake the dead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Kitty, raise your hand. Uh, John, um, you really interested me when you talked about these unpublished manuscripts mm -hmm. of Peter Buys. Mm -hmm. uh, how many of them are there and where are they? How many of them are there? I don't know. Uh, they are right now in our library. And I've already, I've, I have talked to the director a few times about we need to bring these out and get them into good form. Sometimes we'll, we'll play them in manuscript form. A couple of them hmm, are not, not that great. Are they in Bill Rarick's encyclopedia? Bill, do you I don't, know? I don't I'm going to give you my card to ask you to give me a list of that. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, like, like I said, we, um, for many years, I guess the band didn't much care about archiving their history until we began to realize, hey, there's a lot of stuff here. You know, and and we, we have manuscript compositions by a lot of people, not just Peter Bucks. And uh, I personally would like to see them published and you know, your sound band at the top instead of Sousa's band. So, anyway, other questions? Yes? Yeah, John, um, is there a tradition at Hagerstown of having guest conductors come in to do concerts? I asked because Lynn LaRue had me come in mm -hmm. to do a concert, and I played half the concert and conducted some. It's very rare. Yeah. It's very rare. Wow, um, you were privileged. Well, was. When, I was, uh, <laughs> when I was first in the band, I don't bring when I was first in the band, we didn't have guest conductors except for one week when he had what he called high school band director night. And all the high school band directors in the band would each get to conduct one piece. Um, but like I said, I've been there over 20 years. I could count on one hand the times we've had a guest conductor. And it's never been for a whole program. It's only been for like a couple of months. Yeah. Other questions? 